Hey guys, how are you? This is Ishai Breslau, your host of the CRE Shark Eye Show. Hope you guys are doing fantastic today. With us today, Joseph Khan. Today we're going to discuss everything about becoming a developer, being a developer, and consulting a developer or development companies. And uh, from all ends, he's doing a bunch of things, and we're going to hear all about it. We're going to learn tons about what he's doing, and we're going to get some good advice. Uh, Joseph, thank you so much for being with us. Really appreciate it. Pleasure. Uh, you know what? Before we dig into your story and we start discussing and, you know, swimming in this ocean of commercial real estate, if you could tell us, you know, give us a two-minute elevator pitch about what you do. So we started seven years ago, and we are a full-service realty advisory firm. We started out being actually called YK Group Development Consultants. And for our first three and a half years, we mostly focused on development work. So we were like a third party doing project management, on the draft work, asset management, not really so much asset management, but more helping developers and people get projects done. From there, we our clients sort of like pushed us into stabilized assets and or assets that need um, a lot more work. And as we grew, we have built out our team here. So we're a team of 15 people. And we're doing literally anything and everything in commercial real estate from, you know, redeveloping projects, to, you know, helping clients buy stabilized assets to large scale multifamily projects. To, I always tell people we've done everything from converting McDonald's to working to use car dealerships, to working on a $400 million airport for a hedge fund. And we've worked on every asset class from multifamily to um, you know, industrial to office buildings to, you know, if you name that class of real estate, we've done work in it. And all over the country, we did work last year, I think, in 28 different states and on all types of asset classes. So anywhere from a guy buying, you know, a small, you know, $2 million deal to clients buying $150, $300 million portfolios and things like that, everything and everything in between. And that's what we do. So we don't do our construction and we don't do property management. But anything and anywhere in between that you have a need in real estate, we're there to fill what we call the missing piece of the puzzle. So we have a client that just needs an, off an offering memorandum, no problem. We have a client that just needs a underwriting, we'll do that for them. We have a client that needs a whole host of services, we'll do that as well. So we it's sort of like say we have a smorgasbord of services, you tell us what you need and where your pitch point is, and we'll help you get there, you know, get your projects done for you. Thank you. Beautiful. That gives us so much to speak about. But you know, before we dig in, how did you get into real estate? How did you get into this business? How did you get into open your own company? Let's start from the very beginning. Go back in time. So I was working for a college, uh, you know, doing donor relations. And donor doing came what? And said he wants, uh, I missed it. Doing what relations? Donor relations. Okay. So, you know, college, 7,000 students. I was doing donor relations for them. And, you know, what happened was donor came along and said he wants to build a new building. So someone has to go work with the architect, work, you know, on design, you know, design for the donor. And I sort of like, you know, there used to be a person who did that role. He was out. I fell into that position. And I spent five years basically working from the ground up. So from the idea that, okay, we have a piece of property, we want to build something, through the construction process. We built multifamily, you know, we built student housing. We built, um, you know, school buildings. We built study halls, we built libraries, the campus development. And I started basically from the idea of let's do something through construction. So I, I always tell people I start on the wrong side of the table. Most people start out in construction and work backwards. I started out that here's a piece of land. Let's get it to the point of a, a building completed. And you know, being in the not-for-profit world, they really had a chance to learn every step of the way how to do it. And then around seven years ago, I decided enough working in the nonprofit world and all its funness and all its pitfalls. And I went out and started a firm basically doing this as a third party client, as a consulting firm. And then from there, you know, our services and our business has really gone out to where it is now, where we're doing all types of real estate. Tell me something. How many years are you in the business altogether? Twelve. Wow. You know, if you want to include my, my time of an Apple profit work, it's 12, 13 minutes. And tell me something. When was that shift from nonprofit? It was nonprofit, if I understand correctly. I basically one day decided that, you know, I had enough is enough. I got to go out and make, you know, time to move on in life. And so it was like December of 
2014, maybe 2015, December 2015. It's not enough, you know, time to go out. I went out on my own and I started, you know, it was originally called YQ Group Development Consulting. And as the business grew and so much of our work became non-development related, but 60 cents of our work today has nothing to do with development, I decided to rename the company Vision RE. You know, it's right. so that was around two years ago, a little over two years ago, we renamed the company. I find it so interesting because I, you know, I talk to a lot of people, obviously, and I hear everybody's story. Everyone has a different type of angle. Some people came from the legal side of things. Some people came from, uh, but nonprofit is unique, and uh, and people I don't. I always tell people. Yeah. I had a client of mine who asked me, his son just finished college. Not a client, uh, one of our service companies. He asked me, you know, where should my son get training? You know, obviously he wants the son to eventually take over his business. I told him, Zach, you're very much you work with a lot of not for profit. You're you know you're clued into that world a little bit, right? He, he does work with you know. Developers of affordable housing and things like that. Go let your son work for two, three years for not for profit. Like, why? So, I'm like, in the not for profit world, you literally learn everything. Because they don't have that where they can just, like, oh, where you're very so focused just on your one role. If I would have worked for a development company, I maybe would have learned one role of the process. I never would have had the opportunity to start at the beginning and get to the end. Usually, I would say maybe just do the approvals and someone else would take it over from there. I never would learn how to do construction documents. Or I would have taken over at the end of the construction document and learned the construction process. I never would have learned the entitlement process. In the not-for-profit world, you, you get that opportunity to learn it all. Plus, learn so many other skills that I learned along the way that helped me along, whether it was dealing with politicians or whether it was dealing with donors, dealing with different you know, government agencies for things that weren't so much development-related, but there were other roles that the not-for-profit had and I had to fill into those positions. But it was just you know learning how to look at data and understand data and understand you know, where our growth trends are, where do we need to add more study space, where do we need to add more classes, and what, what's going on, what our needs are. You know, understanding that learning process has helped me also understand, okay, if we're in a certain market, how many more units are needed to be built? And doing that market analysis. And so I learned a lot of analysis work along the way that I was able to do all those things. You know, it's, it's amazing. And uh, meaning my in my meaning in my past, I'm also coming from the nonprofit world. But the way you said it, it's like you know, it's an eye opener for sure. And you're so right. In the nonprofit world, obviously, a person who goes in, you have to deal with you know anything from the operations, and it could be building it, building, even having new construction, having new development, and you handle it all, including raising the money which is an unbelievable skill to have also. And you mentioned the politics, the politicians that you have to do, the lobbying, whatever you have to do there. I think it's incredible. Um, let's talk about your business nowadays and how it's developed. Tell us a little bit about how it became, uh, you know, how you grew the business. And then we're going to start talking about the details about what you guys do, et cetera. But how you grew it in terms of how did you grow the business from being a one-man show or two people to have 15 people on staff? It's been sort of like a process where a lot of the things that we've grown were things that we outsourced or clients had a need for. And we said, you know, for example, four years ago, when a client needed an underwriting, we would go and, and go to someone and ask if he'd do an underwriting for our client. We now have full, three full-time underwriters on our staff, right? We had, um, you know, we have, you know, for example, I think the diligence. Right, we brought on a director of the diligence around nine months ago. So we called to run out the diligence department, and you know why? Because we were doing so much diligence work that we felt that we need someone who just focus on running that department. And it's really been, you know, I always say it's filling in those necessary pieces of, of the team and growing it based on our clients' needs. So, for example, you know, we, our clients need offering memorandums to either go raise money or go to banks and things like that. We've added that. You know, we have a full-time person who does, you know, I would say writing and things like that. So that also came out of our need for our clients to give them, you know, reports or they need to have, let's say, you know, documents to giving them for, let's say, a, um, a redevelopment plan where they're going into the city and they're offering the city an RFP, responding to RFP. That's something that I learned from my not-for-profit side. But now I have a lady in our office who basically helps us, our clients write out those, those documents to submit for an RFP. And it's sort of, you know, as we felt the additional needs in our office, we're doing a lot of right now, 
a lot of um, loose abstracts. A lot of our clients are buying office buildings or industrial buildings that have loose loose. And yes, we're doing it in house. And we, ha you know, we have one person or two people who do it in house. But we want to now bring in a person's only focus on doing that work. So because we've had more and more of that work going on, we're now adding additional pieces to the puzzle, additional staff members to do it. So as it's sort of like as the workflow has increased, we've increased our team members to match that workflow. Tell me something. The first service that you guys started giving was what? Was the redevelopment side, the development it side? The development side. Actually, the first service that we started was we won't do anymore. So from my not-for-profit days, I, I developed a lot of relations with utility companies. With the what? Uh, utility company. Electric, gas, things like that. Yes. And, you know, before I even left my not-for-profit job, I was doing consulting with builders because they couldn't understand what the utility company wanted from them. All right? And to me, it was pretty simple. I understood what they were, you know, they were talking two separate languages. And we started out doing work offering utility company, you know, builders, you know, I still have my day job, but, I, you know, I moonlight as a sort of liaison between utility companies and builders. I won't do it anymore because it's not worth my time. An amount of effort, you can't, you can't charge enough money for it. It's not worth it. But that was like our first, you know, foray into that. From there, I went to helping them get approvals and things like that. So it's really, you know, it's been an interesting process from where we started to where we're doing now. But it's all been client-driven and, and finding out what the needs in the market is and filling that missing piece of the puzzle. So what would you say right now, meaning from the involvement, I guess, of the business, is the main activity you guys have today? I would say our feasibility due diligence work is probably 60% of our work. Um, that's 60% of our business. The other 40% is more development related. We develop development, buying approval, so, you know, project management, and that side. Tell us a little bit about the importance of why a developer would come to a company like such as yours, meaning obviously I know it from, from being on that side, how important it is and to have the, you know, the assistance of professionals to come in and to help you understand what the market is, what the feasibility basically in terms of the sales and everything else from A to Z. We understand that. But for those who think, hey, I can get it done on my own. I, I always tell my clients, a lot of our work, we do, you can do yourself. All right, it's just going to cost you four times the amount of money and, and, and five times the amount of time. We don't we don't have you know all our days are are aren't infinite. So if you want to go and do all the work yourself, go do it. All right, you could. Yeah, it's going to take you much longer. Like we were just on the phone with a client of ours, a new client who was looking to um, buy into a deal in Pennsylvania, development deal. So it came to us for the diligence, feasibility, and what we figured out in an hour would have taken a month. All right. So what we figured out was that the cost of the site work just makes the deal too primitive. So what he would have done is he would have taken the plan, tried to go find the road builder, get a quote from the road builder, and we got to the same point that we got to within an hour. So his time has a value, and you know, we basically figured out that it's not around twelve million dollars of work to get this pro done and get all the site work done. And at twelve million dollars, there's no way to deal with it. So you know the experience that we have from deal to deal that we take from deal to deal, that's really on that. But even on our regular due diligence, right? If we're doing due diligence on a multifamily property and we start seeing an issue, next property that we're looking at, we're seeing the same issue. We're pulling red flag right away. So we worked on a property three months ago and we realized that there's a problem with the way they were delivering the T12. All right? And based on the software that they were using in their accrual side, they were not reporting the bad debt. And when you look at the cash side of it, there's a million dollars less of income over the last 12 months. But we got the next deal on a different property a month later, uh, and we saw, oh, they're using the same exact software. We realized they had the same problem, the bad that's missing. It didn't take us a week to figure out what was going on. It took us an hour, and we basically pulled up and we asked for the cash. We realized, yeah, it's also $900,000. So especially right now, say multifamily, if you didn't have, over the last 12 months, you, didn't, you, know, you weren't able to do evictions for eight of them. And so you have, say, 25, 30 people who aren't paying rent. If you're not reporting your bad debt, that's going to make a big difference. So it's that information that we're gleaning from property A to B to C that really helps our clients. And that's why people hire us, that 
besides the fact that we know what we're doing, is that you're, you're basically taking the issues that, that the first person had and helping your second client, your third client, your fourth client. So it's that experience that you're getting from us that, you know, you hire. And then we have clients that hire us. For example, we have a client that closed a deal two weeks ago. It was a $240 million purchase of 14 properties across the state of Florida. Why did he hire us? He had a week to basically go and do his underwriting. He's like, I'm closing two deals that week. My staff is overwhelmed. I just can't do it. How, you know, if I have to put my staff in this, I'm going to shut down my entire shop. I'm not going to ever close my other two deals. He's very happy to pay us to go and do, create that underwriting. I always tell you, you can be a big company. That's the guy who's done $4 billion of acquisitions over the last four years. Pretty big company. He's, he didn't have the resources at that time to do it himself. He hired us to do it. It was much more close to the fact that we made that staff didn't go and snap. So we worked for a lot of small guys and we worked for a lot of big guys, a big deal. And we have other clients that came to us recently and said to us, you know, we know that um, we don't have someone in our company that's focused on, you know, just CapEx on our existing assets. Can you guys walk our properties and figure out, you know, where do we want to spend the money just to keep our properties up to date and keep, make sure operations are working out? We just don't have that resource in house. And that's what we're really about, falling in that pinch point for our clients. Tell me something. If, if I will have to come and tell you, and I'm your new client, and I will tell you, um, it sounds really exciting, and uh, I believe I would need your services, but if you could give us a list for the people who are like coming and getting to meet you the first time, and you want to tell them about the importance, if you could give them a, a sort of a, a shopping list of what you guys are going to take care of in terms of your side, uh, a, B, C, D, that's what we're going to do for you. Can you give us that so we can understand? It's, it's literally, we'll give you a shot of everything besides for doing construction, besides doing property management, right? And so we have a person who's actually my first hire, Chaya Greenbaum. She's our chief operating officer. She sits down with the client and says, what's your project? What do you guys need? And then she goes and creates a proposal based on their needs. So, you know, guys, people call me up all the time and ask me, what does this cost? I'm like, I don't know. Why? We have to understand the project, what it is, what it is that you need, then we'll give you a price. So there's no, it's not like, oh yeah, if you need a lease abstract, I can tell you what it costs. All right, we do, we have clients that buy multifamily that hire us just to do lease work. Go into the property and order every lease, that I can tell you. But after that, there's no set price. It's really, right. what does the project entail? How many hours is going to be on our side? And here's what we think it's going to cost. Right. You need that first meeting in order to understand what's going on, in order to give a proper, right, a proper proposal. That's, right. obvi that's obvious. Um, give us the scope. That's what I'm trying to get to. Give the us scope a scope. is literally yeah. A to Z, right? You might need pre LOI diligence, post, you know, post your contract, post the diligence, lease abstract, lease orders. You might need to do a site visit. You might need to go and do a market study, full performer, full, you know, Model slash perform a offering memorandum, closing services, work with you to get them through closing. Anything you need, we're there to help you with. But it's literally, we got to figure out what your needs are. Not every client has needs service from A to Z. Some clients just need C, G, and T. And that's what we're there for to do is to figure out what the client really needs and how we can help them. So it's literally, if you're buying a property, anything that you can need, we're there to help you with. But it's, you got to figure out what your needs are. Beautiful. I want to ask you something. You've mentioned in the, you know, when we started the conversation, you've mentioned uh, that you do, you know, the whole scope of development in terms of the feasibility of everything. And then you mentioned you help property owners to stabilize their property. Can you, can you explain exactly what, what you mean? So, uh, let's take an example. Let's say you're buying a portfolio of buildings, all right? You want to know before you close how much work is really necessary, all those things. All right? So you're trying to figure out, you're trying to create budgets, you're trying to create a game plan. We'll sit down and help you work out a game plan from today to closing, post-closing, what do you need to do, what needs to happen, all those wonderful things. So we're trying to, basically, as your advisors, we're trying to advise you on how to make this deal work. Did, did it happen to you that people came after they bought the building and they said, listen, yeah. so tell us Tell us about usually, it. Usually, yeah. usually they're, they're, they're in a pickle. They bought a building at 1031 and didn't do property diligence. So, for example, we had a client that bought a property um, here in New Jersey. It was an act. It was a age-restricted 55-plus development. 
They closed on it pretty quickly because the 1031 exchange, they had a six month window. They decided to go for HUD financing. HUD woke up that they did a PCA for, you know, as part of their, you know, package of doing things, that the porches are not ADA compliant. They wouldn't be eligible for HUD financing because the porches are not ADA compliant. We were able to get a structural engineer in there and figure out how to, how to redo these porches, get it to become ADA compliant, and solve all the problems. So basically, you know, when they came to us, they were sort of a pickle. They were like, we can't, there's no way we can even do what HUD wants us to do. Basically, the way HUD would want us to do it, if, if the water would come back into the apartment, they'd have to change the entire picture of the portions and all those things. And when we went there and we started looking at the problem with, you know, engineers to see how we do it, we realized that actually the person who did the report was wrong. And they are, and we got the engineer to write a report that this is actually ADA compliant. And we sort of solved the problem along those lines. So we've worked on anything from, you know, my staff hates when I say this, but usually you're hiring us because you need some brain damage. Or you're hiring us, you know, like this client that we're talking to now about, he wants us to go tour his properties across the country and come back and we give him a report. You know, here's the work you should be doing to keep your property up. You know, it's very, it's maintenance teams are very good at doing the regular day-to-day -day work orders, but he realized from walking one of the properties that he owns that, you know what, no one's really doing long-term maintenance on the property. No one's making sure the property stays where it needs to stay. So how do I keep my property from starting to fall back? What, what's the maintenance program I need to correct? Which hallways need to be painted? You know, where do I want to do some repairs just to keep my class A apartment building class A? And usually those type of work you can't get your team to do because everyone's just focused on, on the day-to-day -day thing. So any of that extras, you know, we're going to come in and create a report and go out and hire a company to get that extra done for so That's a beautiful story. As, as -class That's a beautiful scenario. I love that. Um, you mentioned in the beginning that you guys take care of all asset classes. And what comes to my mind is that every asset class is its own thinking, right? Its own process. Every single thing has to be, uh, has to be studied. And if, if I would grade We've them. It's work. In a sense, it helps us astronomically. Even to say it's like this, right? Let's say an office building or a warehouse. End of the day, office building and warehouse are very, very different. All right? Right. But having worked on both, we're able to take lessons that we learned from A and bring it to B. All right? And a lot of those lessons really help us more than anything else. So having worked on flex space, having worked on self-storage, we do a lot of, you know, I'll discuss so much, we, we do a lot of owner-occupied work. Let's say we have a client who wants to build a new facility for his business. He doesn't know the first thing about real estate. We will help get them approval, work with the architect, get the design, and those things. And we're taking that knowledge that we learned in asset class A and bringing it over to asset class B. And it really unbelievably helps our clients. I can't explain to you, like, astronomy. For, for example, right? Let's say you take a high rise apartment building. So, a high rise apartment building can have air conditioning systems that run, let's say, the whole thing. Right? That's the same air conditioning system that you'll have, let's say, in an office building. And understanding that, and understanding that knowledge, you can really take from class A to class B and things like that. Understanding what it's going to cost you to, you know, renovate a warehouse versus renovating a lab, right? That also helps us. So we had a client that went to the contract on a um, industrial building, and he comes to, okay, so I want to go with the property. He went out to the property down in Pittsburgh. He wanted to demolish most of the office and, and do his like lab area. And we'll have to one second stop. You really have two separate buildings here. You have an office, lab, or some warehouse, and you have a station in the building that's just a warehouse. Right? And it's really separate entrances to it, the separate loading docks. Why not take the area that has the lab and the warehouse right, and the office and get a different rental rate for them? So let's put the building into two. Right? Take the warehouse space and go for like five, four or five dollars per foot, triple that. But the area that you have the labs are in, you have that high end equipment for the labs, for example, it has you have to do filtration systems and things like that that are, have a real value. You can go out and get twelve, fourteen dollars a square foot triple net for that area. And he was just thinking about going and demoing that space. We're like one second, just from talking to the you know building current building manager, we were able to realize that they just spent five years ago around seven million dollars upgrading their air conditioning systems for that area. This way, that their particles, the whole they put in a whole fancy system. Why would I want to walk away from that system and just miles it out? There's a value to that area, a synonymous value. 
So because we've worked on other lab spaces, we were able to recognize that and tell them, hey, stop. We can make you so much more money by dividing the building into two separate tenants. And that's actually the strategy that he went into. So that's what working on different aspects of the classes really, really helps. Tell me something. What that lab became? What did it become? It's out the market now. So now it used to be, you know, basically the company that was in before did manufacturing. They also had to do a lot of research and development for their manufacturing. So we're now asked to go out and do some spaces R and D. The first half of the building is R and D. The other half is regular warehouse. Amazing. Uh, you know what? Moving from between the different asset classes is exciting enough. But moving between also states, moving between locations, that's another challenge. How would you come, because you have to create relationships in, the, you know, in the, those different locations. What did it take for you to, you know, to get to those professionals in those different locations? It's a to certain get that professionalism that we have, a certain way of thinking. So, for example, we're doing a project now down in the central, the western side of the central side of Florida. Right, we're doing two projects for the same client down there. And once we developed that first relationship and got the right lawyer about, it's opened so many doors for us. So that's a major, re- those are two major redevelopment projects. And that literally changed, you know, just by having that right relationship with the attorney and the right architect involved. From there, you were able to get a big start, jump start on it. But also, you know, on one of those redevelopment projects, we went about existing buildings. I got onto a um, e-scooter. Me and one of the guys in my office were there. We toured the building. I'm like, you know what? Let's go understand the neighbor. And we literally got on an e-scooter. And we started scooting around the neighbor just to get a feel of what's going on there. I stopped into two places. Right? One was a beer, uh, you know, like a microbrewery, and one was a museum. And I gave him my card, and I had to find my company just to try to understand the feeling of the neighbor. Both of them called us back. They're interested in the space in the building and the redevelopment project. So it's that understanding that everything is local and trying to find the right local players. That's what we excel. Taking that time and doing that. So, yes, on a, you know, we do enough work on, on multifamily projects down in the south that we understand the southern markets. But whenever I go out to properties, right, and that's one of the advantages that we have. So let's say I go out and walk a property, or one of my staff goes out and works walk a multifamily property acquisition. We'll go into neighboring properties and say, here's our neighbor from Vision Army. We're not a buyer. We're an advisory firm. We're doing a rent comp study. And I can get so much information by doing that because that, that a buyer couldn't get. If you walked into a property and a person feels that you're a buyer of, of real estate, they're not going to tell you what they're charging for rent and what their accuracies are and what their challenges are. But if someone's doing a rent comp study, they'll give you that information. Why, why do you feel that as advisors, it's easier to get information than the owners? If I'm an owner, I'm not telling my competition what I'm charging for rent or what my occupancy is. If you're just doing a rent count study, who cares? And as an advisor, you come in and people say... I'm advising what? someone else. The person who's looking at me at, at the other property doesn't look at me as, as a competition. I got it. And it could be also a potential client eventually, so... I guess we're able to get information that way. It's a very, very different process. That's very, very interesting. Never thought about that way. That's very, very exciting. Um, Tell me something. When you work with your team, tell you know, give us a tip about working with the team, about you know the efficiency of the team, working with the team, managing a team. Tell us a little bit about that. It's always fun managing a team. You know, the HR side of it is always the fun part of it, but. It allows me also, for example, that let's say I'm working on 20 different projects at any time, right? And I have Adobe working also on, we can have, you know, anywhere from 30 to 70 active projects going on in the company on, a, on any given day. It allows me to have team members that are focused just on those projects while we're looking at the bigger picture. So I might go into a meeting, from, you know, have eight different meetings during a day. I work on eight different things, but, you know, and with eight different team members. So let's say my underwriters are really focused on their underwriting work. I'll meet with them about some of the projects, discussions, things like that. Our feasibility team, our diligence teams are focused on their work. So it allows, you know, you're able to get the high level work for myself and some of our other team members. And then there are other people doing the lower end work of it, of putting it all together. 
So instead of me just spending my entire day on one project and, and focused on it, I'm able to use my time so much more efficiently. So every te- every project that we work on always has another team member, at least two team members assigned to it. And they still like fill different roles in the project. You know what? It's interesting because, you know, throughout my career, I found, meaning so many big companies, large firms were doing the work that you guys do, right? And now I find you and uh, you managed to actually take and create a whole business out of this consultancy, you know, uh, uh, genre. But if you could, if you would have to compare uh, the large firms to yourself, what would you, how would you call it? What would you say? What would be your advice? Every service that we offer, you can go hire JLL, JLL CBRE, Cushman Wakefield, Cahiers, and they, they offer our services plus more, right? But then again, you're working with a very, very large firm. And so if, you, if that's the way you want to go, you know, that's your, your progress. Sometimes you don't want to work with the firm that has 2,000 employees. You want to be able to pick up the phone and call me, right, and get my advice. So that's what we're literally offering is that, that small time. So it's like when you go out and hire an accountant, do you want to go to a 15-person firm or do you want to go to a 300-person firm? There's a, different, there's a different relationship, different business model. And that's the difference between us and them. 100%. And that's the personal relationship. We guys, we are listening to Joseph Kahn and his company and the amazing things that they do in terms of all their scope of services. It's unbelievable. And um, if you guys want any advice, you know what, Joseph, tell us how people can find you guys. You guys can see, obviously, the links. You go to our website, visionary.com. You can reach out to uh, me through LinkedIn. So I get a lot of our requirements, you know, I'd say. 30, 30 to 35% of our business comes actually through LinkedIn. Um, and, you know, those are the best ways to reach us. Perfect. Joseph, why can't I tell you? We learned a lot today. Thank you so much for being with us. We, Thank you for your time, Rishai. 100%. 100%. You guys, take care. And I'm going to see you.